think I've heard this out of your mouth before, and I think it's important to, to repeat. Uh, in this case, do you think that Brianna Taylor was a victim? This is the rest of the story with Drew Breezy. I am, of course, Drew Breezy, and uh, I bought I, I brought an enchanting guest for you today. Uh, I, I want to have a discussion with him about the truth. And uh, I think you'll see what I mean. Uh, he is uh, definitely fits into the the puzzle piece of uh, of where we are in society, particularly in the law enforcement culture, when it comes to telling the truth, being intellectually honest, and being mature and having mature discussions. Let me set the scene for you. It was uh, March of 2020. I was uh, at the University of Louisville, the Southern Police Institute, um, where I was uh, attending an executive leadership class. And uh, I got a WhatsApp message uh, from the group chat of all of our classmates. There were several members of LMPD in our class. One of them sat next to me. He was the homicide sergeant or one of the homicide sergeants, which, by the way, should tell you something about Louisville. So <clears throat> there were more than one homicide sergeant. So the text basically read, hey, can you keep a prayer for one of our officers? He was shot and nearly killed last night. He's in critical condition and expected to make it. And I turned on the TV in my, in my, uh, my dorm room there. Um, it, it, you know, it's more like an apartment. It's not a dorm room. Give me a break. But at any rate, I, I turned on the TV, WDRB, I think it was. And, and I saw this news coverage of this officer who was shot. And, and, you know, this is scary stuff. This is, this is a, this could be me moment. The guy was a sergeant in, in a narcotics unit or uh, assisting a narcotic with a narcotic search warrant. That's something that I had just come from before I'd been promoted to Lieutenant. And they were serving a warrant, which we know is a high risk thing to begin with, uh, especially if it's a drug warrant. And the guy was shot, uh, shot in the leg near the uh, femoral artery, from what I understand. And um, that's that was not the big story in that. Th this guy almost died. OK. And then all of a sudden that became secondary to the, the, the story. The guy I'm going to bring in to you is a guy named Sergeant John Mattingly. He wrote a book called 12 Seconds in the Dark. He was involved in the Brianna Taylor uh, raid that uh, it wasn't even a raid. I, I can't even call it that. He was he was part of the team that was serving the search warrant at Bri Brianna Taylor's apartment when she was um, killed. And he was almost killed himself. And I think a lot of people forget about that. And we uh, I, I just want to get the truth out. This is what we want to do. We want to talk about the truth. and. There is no greater advocate for the truth than than a guy who is there. So we're going to the source in this. John, thank you for being here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself or where you are. Hey, Drew, man, I appreciate you having me back. Uh, so I no longer live in Louisville, obviously. I live a couple hours away. We had to move out due to all the threats and all the chaos that went along during 2020. And um, so now I've, I've retired from the police department because I've had to be able to get the truth out. We had gag orders on us. We weren't allowed to talk about it. Uh, when I went back to work after being shot, it was proven I didn't violate any policy, didn't violate any law. Um, and then when I came back, they wanted to basically demote me and put me down in the property room to keep me away from the public, to keep me away from um, anything that might tarnish LMPD is what they said. And I'm like, I got shot and almost died. You know, ripped through my femoral artery. They replaced eight inches of it with a vein. And now I'm getting punished for it. So I could see where this was going. And I went ahead and put my papers in. And now I just travel and I've had the ability to speak at several narcotics uh, uh, conventions. And, and it's been a good time learning new things, meeting new people, and uh, being able to get the truth out. Well, first of all, thank you for doing what you're doing. And I'm very thankful that um, you made it out of that. I mean, I know that it was touch and go for a long time. And um, I, you know, I'm thankful that you're here to begin with, but this all starts with the truth. This is something that you just talked about. This is something that I'm passionate about. And, and I make the case that when you're intellectually dishonest about what occurs in law enforcement and, and you're hearing an example, folks, of somebody whose agency was being intellectually dishonest with this guy, uh, when you're, when you don't have the emotional maturity to explain exactly what went on 
just be honest with the public. This is what happens. You don't you don't just wreck the career of of a guy who served for twenty plus years, who who attained the rank of sergeant. You don't just you ruin his family. You ruin his ability to live peacefully in his, in the community he grew up in, and you besmirch his good reputation, which was stellar up to that point. Obviously, he wouldn't have been a sergeant. So, uh, John, w- where did you grow up specifically, and and what kind of background did you have that that kind of pushed the truth? Yeah, so I grew up in Louisville my entire life. Um, I actually grew up in the impoverished end of town. Uh, my dad was a pastor in the inner city. And for years, they, you know, people in his congregation or deacons were like, hey, you know, the church has grown to over 1,200 people weekly coming in. Why don't we move out of the inner city? And his stance was, no, this is where God wanted me. I'm here to help the people that other people don't want to help. Um, It's a very, we had a very mixed congregation, black, white, Hispanic. And I was engaged in that my entire life growing up. So it gave me an advantage, I feel like, when I became on the police department. I'm dealing with different cultures and backgrounds and even living in that environment in that end of town. um, You know, I saw drug deals. I saw fights. I saw a person was murdered across the street from me. Um, So I was able to be entrenched in that enough. Now, he definitely had us polarized or blocked from a lot of the negative things, but I was able to see it. You can't live in it and not see it. And uh, I think that that really helped me on the police department, engage with people and understand where they were coming from and not be as judgmental. So you were taught good fundamentals in life. Did, were you known reputation wise within that community or within the church, at least, were you well known? Oh yeah. in the church community and the people that came from that area, um, I played ball at the park. So I knew some of the guys that later on, I ended up running into on the street in a negative way. Um, but so yeah, people knew me. I wasn't a I wasn't one of the local, you know, guys that that had all the notoriety because most of those guys were either your drug dealers or your gangbangers. In the spirit of intellectual honesty, and I, and I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think I've heard this out of your mouth before, and I think it's important to to repeat. Uh, in this case, do you think that Brianna Taylor was a victim? Yes. Yeah, I think here's my view of Brianna Taylor, and this this isn't just from this experience. This is from 21 years of policing from living, like I said, in an area I grew up in, these females are taken advantage of every day. So she was raised in a household where her dad's been in prison her whole life. Her mom didn't raise her. Her grandma did. Her grandma eventually passed away in the last few years, and her mom kind of reunited in her life. And so these type women are constantly looking for someone to fill that void of the father figure in their life, someone to love them, someone to protect them, take care of them. And that's what was going on in this case. And a lot of times these women are, are engaged or uh, connected to several different men. And these guys have four, five, six different girlfriends, baby mamas, et cetera. And they use each one of them. One might hold the dope. One might hold the, the money. Um, they bounce around from place to place. And I think she was one of the ones entrapped in that that she was reaching out, looking for acceptance, looking for somewhere to fit in, looking for someone to take care of her and love her. And she was being taken advantage of by Jamarcus Glover. So a victim of circumstance, and then uh, which uh, ironically turned you into a victim of circumstance. And I'm not saying that you're running around claiming victim status. Uh, I've seen quite the opposite. You're a man of integrity and you're just trying to get the truth out. In fact, uh, you, you know, just to shift another gear the book you wrote uh, which is 12 seconds in the dark i'm sure it's still available and by the way i have a complaint mine uh, arrived with a ripped cover so (laughs) if you could send me to your uh, shipping department yeah yeah if you could let the ceo know in in the book you discuss the the you lay out the whole uh case to include uh the approach so uh there's so much talk about no knock warrants and and all of a sudden we've we've uh, had a fundamental shift in policing because we have to ban no knock warrants first of all was that a no knock warrant so the unit that had all the warrants signed we were basically just day labor you know the van came by and picked us up and we went to go do work and we were going to get dropped off at the end of the night and go home that was the plan um so the unit that got these warrants signed on behest of of SWAT because they were assisting us that night, got them all signed as no-knocks because they weren't sure where Jamarcus Glover was going to be, which location. Now, when we came into the office that night, they said, Jamarcus Glover's not going to be on Springfield, which was Breonna Taylor's apartment. 
So it, therefore, no quali does not qualify as a uh, no knock warrant. It doesn't meet the parameters anymore. So at that point, they said knock and announce. And they went above and beyond and said, a matter of fact, knock longer than you normally do because this is a heavy set female. She's home alone. Give her time to come to the door. There's no boyfriends, no dogs, no children. Uh, so the intel was a little off, um, which is not abnormal in these type cases. Sure. Um, but so we went there thinking it was just Brianna and we're going to give her extra time to come to the door, hoping she would cooperate in the investigation. And so we were there for about a minute knocking on the door, announcing police search warrant. Uh, a neighbor came out and confronted us because we were being so loud. Uh, the neighbor on the bottom door, his initial statement was, I heard you all yelling something and I thought you were yelling for me. So I came to the door. And as I got to the door, the, the shot started. So we had two different neighbors corroborate that. Um, and the rest, obviously, as we know, there can be a shooting with 100 people standing right there and nobody sees anything because they have to live in these environments. They don't want the repercussions of somebody coming, calling them a rat. So a lot of people just kind of sat on their hands and said, ah, we didn't hear anything. They didn't even knock, which Kenneth Walker even says we knocked and he heard us saying something, but they didn't know what it was, is, is what he said at the end of the, uh, the day. Because there's a lot of things that I'm, I don't understand about Kenneth Walker. And, and you know, I, I'm not um, fully um, educated on everything that Kenneth Walker said. I know that he's been paid a couple million dollars to, to yeah. shoot a police officer. But um, and, and I, I do realize, like in the intellectual honesty part of that, that there's a little bit more to the story. However, uh, we go from, um, you know, I, I just don't understand how the door opened and he started shooting, thinking that maybe he was being home invaded or whatever, um, to the cops shot my my girlfriend. You know, I, I mean, how, how do we make that leap or how do we what, what am I missing? Well, I'm not. Here's what we're missing. So one of the officers. That showed up on scene. He's the actual courtesy officer. So he lives in that apartment complex where Brianna does. He's good friends or friends with Kenneth Walker, went to middle school with him, high school with him, knows his mom. Um, and when, when this happened, he heard the shots fired, he turned his radio on and he heard a police officer been shot. So he put his uniform on and he came downstairs. Well, Kenneth Walker admitted that he talked to his called his mother first. It's the very first call he made. He didn't call 911 like everybody thinks. He didn't call them until six minutes after the shooting. So he comes downstairs in his uniform. Kenneth Walker's mom's already there. She walks up to him and says, hey, I don't know what's going on. And the, the cop was like, what are you talking about? She said, Kenny called me and said, they're at the door. I said, who's at the door, baby? And he said, it's the police. I got to go. And he hung up. So we don't know when that call took place. We don't know if it was before the door actually came open because they had a minute. He got up, got dressed, got a gun. They both came into the hallway and were waiting for us. So was that call taking place before or was that the call that took place after, which doesn't make any sense? Because in his testimony, he said, when I called my mom, I said they came in and they killed Brianna. And then when he calls 911 six minutes later, he says, I don't know what happened. Somebody just broke in and killed my girlfriend. So he keeps contradicting himself from the beginning. And when he first comes out of the apartment, and this is all on video, he says, Brianna shot us. So this guy has no integrity. Everything he says is a lie. He went on, on a Good Morning America and said, when they shot her, I held her in my arms and took her to the ground. But it's impossible because the bullet holes that were intended for him are right where he was standing. There was three in the wall and two in the door jam. And from the forensics, Brianna was trying to follow him into that room because her feet had actually broken the plane out of the hallway. And then she fell back into the hallway. Ugh. So he's just a he's just a habitual liar. And uh, unfortunately, the media doesn't take the experience about 140 years experience there that night of policing. They take a, a drug dealer's word over seven police officers. And it's pretty sad that we're even in that state that we have to talk about that. Well, that, that's why I say it's so uh, dangerous for police officers. It's, it's dangerous for society because it's the first to the microphone, really. I mean, I know that uh, Benjamin Crump, the attorney, got to the microphone and, and started perpetuating lies like they shot and killed her while she was in her bed and um, all, the, all of the things that the, uh, that, the that, bit that he came out with that everybody went with is he said, we were at the wrong apartment. 
Yeah, right. That, that you said we were at the wrong the apartment. Wrong she was in bed asleep. And uh, the sad thing is the city had all this information at their hands from day one. And they refused to put it out and debunk the lies that were coming out. Because when you've got somebody like a big Trump that comes in, because now he's got Ahmaud Aubrey that he'd already uh, began to represent. And then he went to Breonna Taylor after. And then George Floyd happened. So he had all three of them. He was conflating them all together as one case. These white supremacists coming in, killing our unarmed black people. And so people bought into it. And our, our government, our city government and chief had the opportunity to come out and say, wait a minute, pump the brake. This isn't true. Um, but they didn't do it for whatever reason. And we're not sure. They won't talk to us about it. It's, it's just, it's a crazy thing. Yeah, I, I, this, this is what I'm saying. You know, when you throw a man of integrity to the wolves, somebody who almost died in service for the people of his community, um, it's going to have a chilling effect on the rest of the agency. It's going to have a chilling effect on the rest of law enforcement. And when an attorney gets on and, and perpetuates those lies and nobody stands up for that guy and nobody says, hey, 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 slow down a second. We got to there's another side to the story. Let, let us have the opportunity to tell it. Um, it's it's going to have a ripple effect where people start leaving the profession. And when people start right. bailing on the profession because they don't believe that their city leaders have their back, they don't want to be indicted and they don't want to be killed. They don't want to die in the doorway of, of Kenneth Walker's apartment over some stupid dope. Um, it, it's it's going to make society less safe because if there aren't any quality, integri high integrity police officers left or there aren't, who, who are you going to hire? To, to do yeah. this job and, and who's who's going to be dumb enough to to walk into a job like this and say hey I, i'm fine I, i'll just go out and try to enforce the laws if i get shot i get shot but i'm not going to shoot anybody else uh, so don't worry you don't have to have my back no one's going to do that that's that's insane now so is uh had have you had um other have you had the opportunity to speak with other people who have been in similar situations in law enforcement. Oh yeah. Wide. Matter of fact, I'm supposed to call a guy back today. Whose friend in Austin, Texas is going through trial this week um, for doing his job. I've talked to several people, man. There's this poor uh, DEA agent, female up in Michigan, whose husband was a state police officer who they pulled him from the road, from the highway. And they had these, these individuals riding dirt bikes, four wheelers, all that through the streets, doing wheelies, blocking streets off, doing the thing we see all over the, all over the nation right now. And they put a task force together, put her husband on it and said, Hey, go stop these people. Here's how you do it. Go stop them. So they're going to stop this four wheeler and they pull up beside him trying to get him to pull over. He won't pull over. And he reaches in his waistband and is coming for him. So the officer shoots a taser. Okay. Not a weapon, not his, not his pistol, but a taser. One of them goes in the guy's Afro and the other one misses him. So we know that has no effect on him, right? There's no electricity, no energy going through him because two prongs aren't in yeah, him. Yeah, there's no connection. And so I don't know if the pop of the taser or if he saw him pointing something. Well, the guy adjusted his steering wheel. He ended up flipping the four-wheeler. Well, about four or five days later, he dies in the hospital from his injuries. Guess who they charged for murder? And guess who's in prison right now? That officer who shot the taser that had no effect on this guy. Doing what his department asked him to do, pulled him off his normal duty to do this and now this guy's in prison and that's just kind of the state we're in right now and i've got story after story like that that people call me and are like what do i do and i don't know what to do i can tell them how i got through what i did but i wasn't charged fortunately i think if i hadn't been shot they would have but because they charged everybody around me but you know i don't know what to tell them i'm just like man just bury in your faith dig in your faith put those around you and and you know we'll try to support you as best we can well, speaking of being charged, I mean, um, you know, and I hate to keep jumping around, but um, in theory, if if Kenneth Walker didn't know, and you don't have to answer if, if there's like a legal issue with this or whatever, in theory, if Kenneth Walker didn't know you were the police, was he not firing blindly at people? Um, you know, I, I, I'm I, you're going to hear arguments about <laughs> he has the right to protect his home and it's funny how the gun control advocates are, are silent when it comes to him protecting his home and shooting a police officer, but uh, they're not silent. They're for him. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. Police. That's true. But yeah. so if he's, if he's firing blindly, how is it that 
um, I, I believe Miles Cosgrove was federally indicted for. No, that was Brett. Brett Hankinson was. Oh, I'm sorry, Brett Hankinson. Yeah. For, forgive me. Uh, Miles was fired, uh, but they did not end up indicting him, which is the right thing. So, so Brett, uh, so was it Miles? Uh, was Miles actually the one who shot Brianna, or it, yes. has that been determined? Okay. Yes. And so yeah, we Bre- both shot her, but they they said they believe his bullets one that killed her. Okay. So Brett Hankinson was indicted, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, by, by the Department of Justice. Merrick Garland made a big show of it. Uh, and, and the crux of the indictment was, and, and, you know, forgive me for not having it in front of me, but for shooting blindly and recklessly putting people in danger, for shooting blindly into somebody's apartment. Is, am I, is it fair no, you're to right. say that? Okay. That's spot on. And so originally he was charged on a state level. He went to trial, was acquitted. And I think the reason he was acquitted in a liberal county like Jefferson County that we thought for sure they were going to hang him out. After two hours of deliberation, they came back and acquitted him. I think it's because they finally were able to see the truth. They heard the truth during that trial and were like, oh, man, this we hadn't heard this in two years. Where did this come from? And I'm hoping that'll happen on the federal level as well. Um, however, the feds basically came back and charged him with the same offense, but added civil rights violation to it, which is potential life in prison. He didn't hurt anybody. His bullets hurt drywall. And and that's the big thing people are saying. Oh, he wasn't indicted. I, they didn't indict the one that shot her, just the one that shot drywall. But then when he got indicted, they're like, good, I hope he goes to prison the rest of his life. I'm thinking, well, now you're contradicting yourself once again uh, because they can't stay on topic as far as what they want out of this. And And that's like... And, you know, we're talking about the no knock thing and the ridiculousness of it because it has a place. But even my own senator, Rand Paul, who I like most of the stuff he says and does, but he used he stepped on our backs and used this as an opportunity to pass a no knock bill that someone as a libertarian like himself is against most police action anyway. And he called it the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act and passed the federal no knock, no knock warrant uh, law. And I reached out to his office and talked to him. I was like, hey, I know he's smarter than this because he pounds his chest on how smart he is. He knows this was not a no-knock warrant. Number one, why is he attaching Breonna Taylor's name to this as a no-knock? Number two, ask him, what is justice for Breonna Taylor? Because nobody can answer that for me. Everybody wants to say that justice, justice, what's justice? Nobody can define it. I, I have, this is, this is, uh, man, this is music to my ears. This is what I've been saying since long before I got out of the profession. And by the way, I left the profession to be able to speak freely because we're not allowed to speak freely. But no. when you, when you see things, e- even back to Mike Brown, or, I mean, if you go before that, I, I mean, uh, it's countless. Um, the killings aren't countless, by the way, they all fit on the front side of a t-shirt in regular font. Uh, but, to, mm-hmm. but we're made, uh, the public is made to believe that we're out, you know, just hunting unarmed black people on a constant basis. But um, when, when you talk about no justice, no peace or justice for Brianna, are we talking about justice, justice, or are we talking about revenge? Because those are two different things. Revenge is, well, you know, she was killed. So we're going to put this guy in prison, even though it violates his civil rights, we're going to put him in, in, in prison for violating her civil rights. That's revenge. That's not justice. So I, right. I don't understand the conflict. I don't understand why a U.S. senator would would actually even engage in that. Um, and and we have uh, we have another example of that. Uh, it, by the way, I want to talk real quickly about R- Richards versus Wisconsin. It was a 1997 case, um, and it was uh, it, it, this is the the Supreme Court case. Essentially, the Supreme Court affirmed the Wisconsin S- Supreme Court's decision about no knock warrants. So now this is in 1991. We're at the height of the, the crack era. And the crux of the, 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 uh, the case that, that became the bright line or, or the, that became the no knock case is that they used, um, <laughs> they understood that it was a dangerous game, especially serving drug warrants. Like how ironic. So they they tried to serve a drug warrant in a hotel room, by the way, and they didn't. Um, those officers that night dressed as maintenance men, 
and there was a, a uniformed officer too deep. They they were dressed as maintenance men. They were in disguises. They were undercover. Now, you have experience. I know that you speak to narcotics groups across the nation. Uh, I know how they do things in as as recently as 2018. I, I've served search. I've approved, written, and served search warrants. You know, as recently as three or four years ago. There isn't a a, a a drug unit alive that's worth a damn that doesn't fully wear police gear, uh, badging, um, and and announce police search warrant, police or sheriff's office search warrant. Um, so right. the crux of this whole Supreme Court case is on a bunch of guys who who were dressed as maintenance men, essentially. But even then, the Supreme Court agreed, hey, you guys got to do what you got to do. If if you apply for this no-knock warrant and the magistrate agrees with you, feel free to go in if you think that there is an exigent circumstance in the in the way of evidence, which has gone by the wayside. We don't really do no-knock warrants for evidentiary purposes that much no. anymore. Or there's a threat to life inside or a threat to the life of the law enforcement officer. So I... I that night, was there any, uh, were you dressed as a maintenance man, I guess is the, the most simple question I can ask you. No, and I tell people this too. When you put your your vest on that has police across the top, you've got your badge on your belt, you've got your gun, you've got your flashlight, you're probably more recognized than a guy just in a blue uniform with a little badge right here when that door comes open. And so the fact that that's another huge thing they 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 kept saying they were in plain clothes but they were leaving out the fact they were in plain clothes but they had tack vests on that said police all over them they left that out on all of it just like they in in a lot of the articles you'll never see a police officer was shot or you'll they'll say oh he, there was a graze wound to the leg or something insignificant that you're like no that's not how this actually went down because if you put everything in context it makes sense but I've told I've told people all across the country and, and on podcasts and my kids, even when their friends initially were coming at them, I said, if I were on the outside looking in and for a year and a half, all I saw was police did X, Y, Z, these five, six huge things that were wrong and the government or the city paid them $12 million, the city or nobody ever defended them. So they must be guilty. Right. I would think that. Uh, yeah, I, I would I, sit I back and go, well, I guess that's the case. I, I guess I understand that if, if that, but that's, again, this is, that's just all lends to the dishonesty and that's what's getting people hurt yeah. and what's getting people killed. Um, so there was, uh, while we're on the topic, there was a chief of police in Minnesota that uh, was testifying before a judiciary public safety omnibus bill. It included gun control measures uh, and, and it's in Minnesota. It's in a very liberal or, or left leaning state. Uh, but it also included the banning of no-knock warrants, just like Rand Paul did in Kentucky. Banning. And, and again, this is <laughs> there are already measures in place when you go to apply for a no-knock warrant that y you have to prove to the judge or you have to prove that. I mean, the Supreme Court said that. So there was a police chief in Minnesota, and she testified before the uh, Omnibus Judiciary and Public Safety Finance and Policy Bill Committee. Um, this was a, a conference committee. She is the chief of police of a 19-person department. She, according to her open source uh, LinkedIn, she worked at, previously for a few years at a 14-person department, and she rose to the, the level of, of chief at this 19-person department. And here she is testifying to ban no-knock warrants. So let's take a listen to what the chief has to say here. Um, let's see, I've got uh, Chief Kelly McCarthy. Oh, they are here. <laughs> I can never see through the tall backs of the chairs to tell who's in the first rows. So uh, welcome to the committee, Chief. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you so much for having me here. I, I love testifying at these because it's like when you were little, the people from Fantasy Island would be on Love Boat, like those crossovers. <laughs> Um, so it's very exciting for me. Uh, my name is Kelly McCarthy, and I'm the current chief of the Mendota Heights Police Department. And I'm here today to just really encourage you to limit, preferably ban, the use of no-knock warrants. 
Uh, this topic is one that I'm very passionate about, and I think there's some real ground to cover here because everybody who talks about no-knock warrants wants the same thing, which is to save lives. We just are going about it a different way. I have written no-knock search warrants. I have served no-knock search warrants. I will not do that going forward because I now know better. I know there's a better way to save lives. And don't take my word for it. I'm just a big dumb cop in a small suburb. <laughs> but listen to the National Tactical Officers Association and the statement that they put out, which is that the use of no-knock warrants is counterintuitive and it puts the public and officers at risk. These are the experts in the field. These aren't people who are telling you how it used to be done. They're the ones who are doing it going forward and they're telling you to ban no-knock warrants. So they will tell you that it will save lives. And not only do they talk about safety, but they actually put action behind their words. And you can imagine tactical officers were a little bit displeased when their association put restraints or came out and told them what you're doing is dumb. So what they did is they brought their executive director and their head of training to our statewide tactical officers association and they trained our tactical units in a better way to do these, which does not include no-knock warrants. So we know better, please let's do better. Let's save the lives of our constituents and of our officers. And of course, um, I just wanna make sure I, I don't have any else with my notes. Um, and I think that's it. So if there's any questions, <laughs> I will of course stand for them. If not, thank you so much uh, to everybody for all the work that you do. Uh, any uh, member questions for Chief McCarthy? Um, I'm sure they will stick around um, after we have the other testimony. If there are uh, questions, we can always come, come back to you. Uh, okay. Uh, if you didn't catch that, and I, and I know you and I have talked about this, John, but for those watching, if you didn't catch that at the end, um, she placed her notepad, she flipped her notepad up and it said, no knock warrants are dumb. Ask that to the person who is a hostage inside of a place. I think they'll disagree with her. And when she talked about the NTOA, the National Tactical Officers Association, I have talked to them. She's correct on most of that. However, they still have caveats where they use no knocks, but the, the stance now nationwide is to surround and call out or breach and call out. And our department went to that in our, in our uh, SWAT team, probably in 2018, but they never brought us up to task on that. The last time they trained us on any warrants is the same way we've been trained for years, which is the same way we did it that night. And so do I agree that Things need to change from the old thinking. Would I ever go back and do another forced entry or a dynamic entry for money, dope, or paperwork? No, I wouldn't. I would I would breach and call out or I would surround and call out. So there are some things that can change with times to enhance uh, our safety and the safety of those inside, even though I think our safety is much more important. Um, if you're dealing with, you know, dope heads and, and people who are killing people with their fentanyl. Not talking about your average citizens. We're not against them. Well, thank you for uh, so I don't for want that saying getting twisted. Thank you for saying that. I, they're killing people with fentanyl now. Listen, I, I I am not opposed to what she said, up until the point where she talks about the ban. And I and I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I definitely and you know, I, we we started this discussion about being intellectually honest. And and thank you for pointing out what NTOA says, because it is a stance that they have, where you can do more um, controlled entry or, or, or wait, you know, wait out the situation or preferably search an empty house, but it's not always, uh, it's not always, feasible. always feasible. So now yeah. the, the, what comes to in mind and what I have, uh, you know, on the screen here is actually Natoa's uh, NTOA's uh, stance on the, on the matter. It's a, it's a PDF. You can download it. Anybody can download it and read what they say. Cause what it does it not say anywhere, it's a PDF. So if you hit control F for the search function, if you search for the word ban, you will never find that in there. If you search for the word dumb, you will never find that in there. What, what they're essentially saying in the, in the statement is look, 
there is a better way to do things. And now she's hanging her hat on. She noticed she didn't bring up Brianna Taylor or whatever, she, because they have their own version in um, in Minnesota, which is the Amir Lock incident. And if you're not familiar, mm-hmm. they they made entry into uh, a, an apartment. I think it was looking for. They had a warrant for a murder suspect, and I believe right. they uh, they exercised the no knock, and they went in. And Amir Lock um, emerged from under his blanket and pointed a gun at a police officer. So he was shot and killed. Um, and I'm not sure that <laughs> knocking on the door for six or seven minutes while they still have the leg to stand on uh, of uh, no pun intended. They, they still have Kenneth Walker's leg to stand on, basically, to say, I didn't know they were cops. So the minute you open the door as a police officer, you're met with gunfire. And and you know right. that all too well. You're in you're in a fatal funnel, even if you do the crisscross or button hook or whatever NTOA wants to teach you. you you're going to be in that fatal. At some funnel point, you got to go through the door. You got to go through the door. You got to breach the door There's at no some point. Yeah. And 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 that guy has a gun. And if he wants to take you out, he is going to take you out. Whether you now, if if there is an option to do this by the element of surprise, and you have a crystal ball and know that he's in there with a gun under his his blanket. Don't you think that it's prudent to use that? I, I mean, I'm, I'm asking rhetorically. I don't, you know, I, I think I know where you stand, but, I, you know, well, go ahead. Drew, the funny thing about this case, I know the lieutenant who's now, I think, a major or something um, on that police department. And the guy that shot actually worked for him. And he also at some point had had been over Derek Chavon. So I asked this guy many things about this department going, man, what's going on? One of the things his department failed to do on this case is they had another video from a different angle that showed him peeking before he came out with the gun. He knew they were there. He knew they were police. He chose his destiny at that point. And his department would not put that out for whatever reason, just like ours wouldn't. And that's the thing that's so frustrating to police or police supporters is that why are we not using every opportunity or every ability we have? to put the truth out and then let people decide for themselves because they're not doing that for whatever reason. I know it's a political stance. I know the mayors are pushing them um, to do whatever they want them to do. And, and that's a problem with policing though, is that the police answer to mayors. We need more sheriffs that answer to the people. I love your analysis in this because it's going to take the, the small town police chief or the mayor or the sheriff to stand up and say, look, enough's enough. I do understand that a life was lost here. We're, we're not compassionless robots. And John, frankly speaking, between you and me and, and the millions of people that are watching, I'm sure, uh, if you had to do this all over again, I guarantee you wouldn't because you'd have your entire femoral artery intact and Brianna Taylor would still be alive and you wouldn't care about Brianna Taylor either way. You would be more focused on Jamarcus Glover, you know, allegedly dealing poisonous, deadly drugs into, in, into the uh, surrounding community of Louisville. Right. But what what they're saying is um, we've got to get as police chiefs or sheriffs or whatever, we've got to work in the, in, in the, in the spirit of transparency to get that body camera footage out within 48 hours. So you all see that this is yeah. how things happen. However, that's the only part of the story we're going to tell you. We're going to let you run with, with the rest of the story. And that's, what's making all of these left-leaning or liberal run cities even more dangerous than they need to be yeah it is and another thing on that case that i forgot to mention was i remember the media running with he wasn't even one of the suspects he was a cousin of one of them that happened to be staying at this guy's place that was a total lie this guy was named as one of the suspects he was on the warrant and again just they let the lie run and people bought into it Because, you know, in our minds, we're raised to think the media is going to tell us the truth. Right. Now, I think more and more as time's going on, people are waking up going, wait a minute. I keep seeing, I keep getting lied to and I keep falling for it. And that's why I think all the the independent media on Twitter and different places is blowing up because people are tired of the lies. And so hopefully with shows like yours and others like it, we can get the truth out and people will actually listen and go, you know, that makes sense. You know, we're not we're not sitting here pounding chest saying police are always right or that everything we did was perfect. But we are saying, hey, here's at least the truth. Decide for yourself. And we're putting all facets out. Not, it's not going to be one sided. Yeah. And it's it's it, like remove the vilification. It's just part of the conversation. It is just part of of life. But 
it's not the focus of the conversation. So when you testify before a, a committee and you make it the focus of let's ban search warrants, let's take a tool out of the toolbox because I disagree with it. And, and I'll be quite honest, uh, I, I'm a little bit inflamed by that chief of police saying things like constituents, like let's do better for our constituents. Uh, when I served, I didn't have constituents. I was no. a referee. I, I, I called well, balls and strikes. Serving. I was a servant. I, I completely, yeah. I was a servant to the people of the community and I was a servant to the people that I worked with. So it, it's, and that's a different mindset than these leaders have because they, they climb people's back to get wherever they want to be. Yes. And you know, I'm not calling this chief a liar. I don't know her. Maybe she's telling the truth, Sure. but I have found it hard to believe a person from a 14 man department who was probably an admin, most of their career trying to climb the ladder wrote and served no knock warrants because I I did this for 14 years <laughs> of serving warrants and doing narcotics. And I had maybe two in that yeah. entire time. Yeah. I, so I, I'm, I'm fine. And we did, I'm talking, I've done over 2000 warrants. So you're looking at that percentage two out of 2000 compared to what she's saying. I guarantee you she hadn't served 2000 warrants and she's got, she said multiple or she said, choose the word plural. I've, I've done and served uh, no knock warrants. And I, I just, I'm calling bull on that one. I'm calling bull on that one too. Uh, it just, uh, I'm going to lend some experience into this just like you are. I, I was in narcotics from uh, 1995 to about 2006, the first time. Um, and I, 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 I was good at authoring and serving search warrants. That was my thing. Uh, you know, uh, some, some guys are good at undercover. I look like this when I'm undercover. So I was not good at that. I had to get good at something else. So I, I got good at the probable cause and I got good at, good at the case law and the legalities and, and the intricacies of serving a search warrant. And I, I can tell you, I was our guy when it came to writing search warrants. I, I'd go triple digits of the number of search warrants I wrote over my career or approved because later in life, I came back as a supervisor to an undercover unit. I ran a street crimes unit, much like you did. I ran a, um, a, a selective operations section, a, a group of detectives that, that worked a wide variety of, uh, of crimes, but we served search warrants. In fact, you know, my own agency had an incident where they shot an unarmed black male uh, while serving a search warrant. My unit was the first to serve a search warrant after that one. Um, and, and, you know, you talk about butterflies or bees in your stomach. I mean, you know, uh, you definitely don't want that to happen. But, you know, we didn't want that to happen the first time either. Again, we're not emotionless robots. But I am telling you from, from my entire career perspective, and I've been in some very hairy situations, serving search warrants on the fly, uh, securing people inside a residence to go get a search warrant. I cannot tell you that I've ever served or written a no-knock search warrant. I, I, I can't recall. Ever yeah, they're rare. It. So the argument again, in Minnesota became w amongst the legislators, like you can't provide an example, then you don't need it. And that's not true. That's that is an intellectually dishonest. Just because I can't provide an, an example of uh, of a, uh, you know, just pulling something out of thin air, you, you can't provide an example of um, of a kid eating Pop Rocks and drinking a Pepsi and their stomach exploding. It's folklore, right. but you can provide an exa an actual example. That doesn't mean we should outlaw Pop Rocks and, and Coca-Cola. It, there's a just... huge fallacy. There's a huge fallacy in that argument anyway. How many cops do you know shot people in their entire career? So does that mean they don't need their gun? Exactly. That that's. I know... mean, most cops do not shoot people. And, I, you know, you go 20 anybody. years and you go, how many people did you shoot? None. Well, why'd you carry a gun? <laughs> okay, well, it's still another tool in our tool belt. Exactly. So we might need that no knock at some point. So why are you taking that advantage away from us? Yeah, it, uh, it makes no sense. In the, in the safety that's the difference of between a politician and a cop. Exactly. It's because it's in the safety of the officers that you're supposed to be serving. It's also in the safety of the citizens in that community. So if, if the element of surprise is going to help you, why would you go so far as to put into legislation that you can't do that anymore yeah. when the existing Finger. law says you have to go above and beyond to prove that you need this exigent entry, this this beyond dynamic entry. Every entry should be dynamic, come to think of it. But I mean, like, th this is beyond, like, you already have to prove ab uh, above. Now, from what I understand, um, that uh, parts of that did not, the ban part did not make it into uh, what was passed. The, 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 um, 
there, there was language about the use of no-knock warrants, but it was essentially what the Supreme Court already said to do. Um, I want to show also the public, uh, to be honest, the document that was put forward by uh, the chiefs of police in Minnesota. It's three organizations. I'm going to get the names wrong, so I don't even want to say them. But it's it's essentially like the sheriffs, the chiefs of police, and the Peace Officers Association. And they were completely opposed to banning anything. They were opposed to the language in the um, in the bill itself, and they uh, said so by letter they sent. So I don't know if this chief is just rogue and she wants to, you know, climb the political ladder on the, at the expense of, of her officers or actually officers across Minnesota who actually work in dangerous areas. And I'm not even trying to slight her, her. Well, obviously they had to cherry pick what chief they wanted to come in and talk because the other ones weren't going to give them the answer they wanted. So they found this and there's nothing in small departments. They're needed in small areas. But the lack of experience from those small departments shows in, in instances like this. And so you can't bring someone without the experience or without maybe being in that type of more dangerous atmosphere like a Chicago, like a Minneapolis, like a Louisville, like a St. Louis, whatever, and say, OK, apply the same tactics in your little small middle to upper class community to inner cities. Yeah, it just doesn't work the same three, you know, three. I, I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but I think it was like three robberies in, in calendar year 2022. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, it's just a, it, it, so it's listen, every hour here. It, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's a different. There's no harm in bringing the debate forward. There's no harm in bringing. But, you know, like, hey, listen, I'm a police chief and I think we should ban uh, no knock warrants. But hearing the other side of the story or hearing the issue, because this is what's become the, the, the broader issue. When somebody gets shot, everybody wants to have a conversation. Everybody wants to have a conversation. But when you engage in the conversation and you say things that they don't want to hear, it becomes an issue of, well, you just don't have my experience or you don't have it. it this is where it rears its ugly head the most, John. Um, an unarmed black man gets shot. The law enforcement officer says, look, it's not clear cut here. You're only seeing about 10 seconds of video. And by the way, he was wrestling for the officer's gun when he was shot. Well, you just don't know the experiences of a black man, so you can't give an opinion. But you don't know the experiences of a police officer. So why is it OK for you to give an opinion? And, and, and I have right. to be silent and respect yours. It, it, it should work uh, as a two way conversation. And, in, in this this banning of no knock warrants is is no exception. I kind of want to close with um, of why I think this is important for for all of us to understand. The, the, being intellectually dishonest is uh, is making us less safe in the United States, and I, I'm I'm sure you're aware of this. The Tampa Bay Rays, I think it was the 2020 season, but it had to have been the 2021 season, maybe the 2022 season tweeted out, and I don't, I don't even want to share the tweet because it's disgusting in my opinion, but it said, uh, it's a great day for opening day, great day for baseball, it's a great day to arrest the murderers of Breonna Taylor. Um, and I, I took exception to that, first of all, um, because it it has no place, you know, come on, you, you're a baseball organization. Uh, and th- that's pure virtue signaling, but it's dishonest because she wasn't murdered in the sense that you're saying that she's murdered by police officers. She, her boyfriend took it upon himself to shoot blindly, almost killed a police officer, a highly decorated police officer, might I add. And the return fire, she was caught in the middle of and she died. There was no intent to murder her. She unfortunately and tragically died. No question. That's not a murder. One. And two. How are you going to intermingle that? Why are you going to bring baseball fans into this? Why are you going to bring them down and, and try to lie and push that forward? Now, the reason I'm saying this and why, and why I'm a little bit kind of passionate about what the Tampa Bay Rays ha- had to say, because I think the person that tweeted that out was probably removed from their position. But this is a program from the funeral of Tom Batinger and Jeff Yaslowitz. Those two were killed serving an arrest warrant on a guy named Hydra Lacey, a black male. And uh, Hydra Lacey was ha- hiding in his attic. Uh, one of them was a canine officer. He was hiding in his attic, and they went to serve this, uh, this warrant, take him, take him to jail. And uh, they went to ser- send the dog up, and Hydra Lacey just 
started lighting up all the officers. It was a, I think it was even a U.S. Marshal uh, Task Force kind of warrant. So he tragically shot and killed these two officers. Hydra Lacey, again, was a black male, but the conversation is never black male kills two white police officers. It's always white police officers killing black males. There's a problem with that. This is the foul poll that I discovered in at Tropicana Field. This is a silent tribute. Some of those guys worked off duty. The top uh, prayer card you're going to see is for a, a, an officer named David Crawford. David Crawford was shot and killed, I think, a month later, maybe three weeks later. So they had a, a spate of maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years with no line of duty deaths, and they had three within the same month or so. Oh. And and this is all, their little badges are, are uh, you know, in silent tribute behind the foul pole in um, right field at Tropicana Field. And I got to see that because I was behind the scenes. I was there doing a site survey for the Republican National Convention. And, you know, I, I thought this was sweet. It was a very solemn tribute. It was, you know, the guys that they knew, the, the cops that they knew that worked Tropicana Field during the baseball games. You fast forward a couple of years later, and this tweet comes out, and and it specifically targets you, John. I mean, it's 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 offensive to me on very me- uh, for for a lot of reasons. One that we've said over and over: it's making society less safe, because people are buying into the lie that there is a division between white officers and black people. It's making us the the boogeyman in the black community. Um, it, it's uh, it's it's doing more way more damn ben crump is is responsible for doing a lot of damage in uh the unity and and relation between uh between all of us let's be let's be clear so i ended up not going to several seasons of of tampa bay rays baseball specifically for that they they came back with a statement and uh it was too late it's it's just like Ben Crump. It's the first person in the microphone that they're going to hear that. The retraction right. is uh, maybe a small percentage, 10, 15 percent are going to see the, the retraction. I was at a game uh, a couple of years later. We fast forward a couple of years later and I took this video that I'm about to show you. My father-in-law texted me something like, I can't believe you're not wearing a race shirt or I can't believe you're not supporting our team or and, and th- this is what I said. And, I, and, and I realize this gets nobody anywhere, but it's it's in solemn tribute. It's for guys like you, John. Uh, if you'll look, this is the movie I took. This uh, is um, Tropicana Field. I'm going to play it. If you'll look in left center, you'll see 285, K2, Sierra 23, and 143 Bravo. The numbers 42, 12, and 66 are, are um, Major League Baseball retired numbers or Tampa Bay Rays retired numbers. But 285, K2, and Sierra... Uh, Sierra 23 and 143 uh, Bravo, they refer to four police officers that were killed in the line of duty. Then, uh, and, and by the way, three of them by black males. And then when you pan over, this is what you see in right center. So Major League Baseball, specifically the Tampa Bay Rays, has blocked off, had blocked off an entire section to say this. Black Lives Matter, as if, John, you and I never thought that Black Lives Matter to begin with. And that's offensive to me. Um, So, without putting you on the spot, does that evoke any emotion in you? You know, I saw that in 2020 or 21, whenever it was, at the start of that next season. And every time I turn a basketball game or a football game on or any season during that, I couldn't get through a game without hearing something about us or something about Breonna Taylor or the injustice. And so I got to the point where, and I was a sports fanatic. I got to the point where I don't even watch sports anymore. They turned me off to it. I've tried to get back into it. I'm a huge Cowboys fan. I know that's a, you know, it's got its own stigma, Um, but I'm a huge Cowboys fan. And as far as I know, they didn't say anything, but still I have a hard time following that stuff just because the bad taste it left in my mouth. And I've tried to get over a lot of it because I'm like, man, these idiots are just putting their, whatever they think is popular at the time they're throwing out there. Next week, it's something else. The next week is something else. If I ran into them in public, they they wouldn't even know who I was. So I try to put it in perspective, but at the same time, it does make you turned off, a little bitter maybe, 
you know, I try not to be bitter because that just affects me and not them. They could care less. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's no fun to look at. Um, this is the reason why I wanted to have this conversation today. Not, not to, not to throw a shocking or bring you down uh, kind of movie and put it in your face. It's, it's to show the public, look, when you're talking about um, black lives matter and, and then you turn around and say, it's offensive when you say all lives matter or, you know, uh, I get the argument or the debate of, uh, well, blue lives matter was a direct response to black lives matter, but they do. And, and, and black lives do matter and blue lives do matter and all lives matter. And you're right. We we've gone to this virtual signaling world of, um, 10 second click clips on TikTok, 20 second clips on, um, WDRB where Ben Crump is able to, to, to tell the world how horrible, uh, you and, and miles and, and everybody else are, but nobody from the city is coming to your rescue because they're afraid of the, of the, um, the backlash. Um, and so, you know, that's just the point of the exercise today. It's about intellectual well, let me, honesty. Let me say one more thing. Yeah. So Drew, I'll tell you who the biggest proponents of black lives matter is. And people aren't going to understand this or believe it, but it's the police. Cause you've got white guys from the suburbs putting on a uniform, knowing they could die going into black neighborhoods to protect black lives of people that don't like them. And there's no better example of somebody thinking a black life matters than going into their neighborhood to protect them, even though, you know, you're hated by half of them. So if that's not the best example, we're not a Hollywood star putting our little video clip out on our chest, wearing our shirts as black lives matter, but we're actually physically going and doing something and risking our lives for black lives. And that's what I want people to see. Thank you for saying that. Uh, it's the perfect closing. I, I just want to, I want to say this, this is, this is the cause that I got out of law enforcement to do, to be able to speak loudly, hopefully grow my platform so more people can hear and understand the truth to bring people together, not to split people apart, but right. your, your specific case and all of these officers who are being wrongfully charged in the name of uh, virtue signaling that and dispatchers, in my opinion, uh, are completely underserved. Those are my two causes and they have a tie in and the specific tie in is this. If anybody calls 911 and says they need you or they need me, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm running people off the road to get there to save them, kick their door in to save them from being stabbed, kick their door in to help them put their fire out in their kitchen. And at no point does that 911 operator say, hang on a second, are you black or are you white? What's the color of your skin? Where do you stand on Black Lives Matter? Where do you stand on police officers? Where do you stand on the Brianna Taylor incident? Nobody says that. We just go out right. and we do it. And just like you say, we got a whole crop of police officers that are willing to go out there and sacrifice themselves to protect every community, black, white. It, and, and it's a shame that we're even segmented in 2023. I thought that we were supposed to be headed towards content of character, not color of skin. Uh, I'll stick to that. But uh, if you have any parting words. No, man, I just appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you pushing the truth, not just in my case, but just in general across the board for police, because we've got to have a voice. And uh, I appreciate you guys doing it. All right. The book is 12 Seconds in the Dark. It's uh, written by um, uh, a police officer's firsthand account of the Brianna Taylor raid. It's written by Sergeant John Mattingly, who was gracious enough to join us today. Uh, I'll put his contact information. Listen, he is a, a, a good hire. If you want to pay to have him come speak, I think that would be a, a great thing. He's got a, a, a great message. And uh, he's a humble human being and uh, a man of integrity. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with me today. Uh, until next time, Drew Breezy, I'm out.